God sent Christ into the world to redeem us from sin. As it was stated in Luke 1 and verse 68, that He hath visited and redeemed His people. Christ, that's what His purpose was, to come and to redeem His people. Redeemed is to liberate by payment of a ransom, deliverance, It especially is dealing with the penalty of sin, being liberated by a payment from the penalty of sin. We are a redeemed people. And as such, though, we are to bear fruit for God, for Christ. Uh, John the Baptist would teach us that uh, we are to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, uh, Matthew 3 and verse 8. In the parable of the sower that Jesus set forth, the seed that fell on the good soil was that seed that bore fruit. Uh, We are, as a redeemed people, to bear fruit thus. But the question then comes, what is the fruit that you and I are to bear? Because I don't think that this is, aspect is really studied often enough. Because a lot of people just, we talk about bearing fruit. What is it though? Well, sure, we're to bear fruit. But we don't know what it is. Well, we noted in John the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 8 and then verse 16, within that context, it talks about our need to bear fruit. And the, one, the branch that does not bear fruit will be broken off and cast into the fire. But when you look at that which is between those two passages, verses 9 through verse 15, we see that that fruit that we bear and the context is that our love for God. And thus, when we learn, for example, in 1 John 5 and verse 3, that the love of God is the keeping of His commandments, bearing fruit thus that Jesus is talking about is the keeping of His commandments. Then we also noted that righteousness, in Philippians 1 and verse 11, that you see there, but also in Hebrews 12 and verse 11, James 3 and verse 18, we are to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Well, there's the bearing of fruit. What is that fruit? It's the fruit of righteousness. Well, when you study the righteousness as set forth by God, you see that it has to deal with all of God's commands or righteousness, that it's revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we do those things, We are righteous even as He is righteous. So being filled with the fruits of righteousness is when one does or he obeys all of the commandments of God. When he obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is then bearing fruit. Then last week we noted another one and that of being holy, holiness. Romans 6 and verse 22. uh, Your fruit unto holiness, which brings about, or the end, everlasting life. Holy, holiness, saint, sanctified, all come from the same Greek word, just used in our English in a little bit different manner or grammar. But it's dealing primarily with being set apart. We must be set apart from sin, and then we must be dedicated or consecrated to God's service. That's what being holy is. And thus, when we are freed from our sin, when we are dedicated and consecrating our life to God, then we are having our fruit unto holiness, the end everlasting life. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter in verse 9, we're set forth three different things as far as the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Goodness is very simply that uprightness of heart. 
the uprightness of life that is necessary. It deals with being kind one to another. Righteousness is that which is right. It deals with and finds an application in our right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. Truth is, as defined by many in this context, as a personal excellence, that candor of mind which is free from affection, pretense, simulation, falsehood, or deceit. It is being honest with someone, truthful in everything that you do and everything that you say. But another fruit that we are to bear would be found in Ephesians or Philippians, the fourth chapter and verse 17. When Paul would write, Not because I desired a desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Within this context, Paul was in prison in Rome. This is one of those four prison epistles that is often discussed. The brethren at Philippi sent him a a very generous contribution by the hands of Epaphroditus. And... The Philippian letter is written with that as its basis. You see him talking about their fellowship in the gospel in chapter 1. The gift and the individuals that were there. But when we get to chapter 4, we see this in particular. That, well, for example, in verse 15, no church communicated with me uh, concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. The idea of giving and receiving is literally banking terms. The taking in of money or credit and then the dispensing of that money. Giving and receiving. They received from others a contribution. They sent it to Paul. And he says in verse 16, when I, Even when I was in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Now then in verse 17, Not because I desired a gift, but because I desired fruit that may abound to your glory. By their help, their financial support of Paul, they were exhibiting the fruit of their discipleship. A fruit that will abound to your account. When we give to the Lord's cause, we are bearing fruit. Upon the first day of the week, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and verse 2, now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered, that there be no gatherings when I come. And let me add, what Paul, and this is just one of the several times in which Paul in this 1 Corinthian letter states what I've written to you, I've written to all of the churches. And thus it applies to you and to me today that on the first day of the week, we are to lay by him in store. We are to put into a common treasury. It is based upon as God has prospered prospered us. So we are giving our money, our financial assistance, into the work of the church into that common treasury of the Lord. We do that upon the first day of the week. That is our obligation as Christians. That is what God has ordered the churches. And that includes the church in Pensacola or the Bellevue congregation. Because what he wrote to one, he wrote to all. What it was applicable to one, was applicable to all of them. But when we as Christians 
are giving our free will offering, realizing as God has prospered us and we put that money into the collection plate, as we refer to it, we are bearing fruit for God. That's the point that Paul is making there in Philippians 4. Here's brethren giving their money And by that giving, it is being sent to him in support of his preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, in support of him as being a missionary, now then being in prison. And he says that by doing so, that is fruit that may abound to your account. As Paul is writing his second letter to the Corinthian brethren, In chapters, uh, both the entire chapter 8 and chapter 9 is dealing with this same collection, this same giving of our money into that common treasury. In verses 6 and verse 7, he says, "In, "...in so much that we desire Titus, that he, as he had begun, so he would also finish in you this same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Notice this specific word that Paul uses in relationship to this giving. Two different times in these two verses. This grace, the same grace... He refers to that giving of money, putting that into that common treasury as a grace. We generally think of grace as a gift that God gives unto us. And what Paul is saying when he's using this term grace is that God has given you that opportunity. He has given something to you for your benefit. What is it? The ability to give, to contribute funds into the church treasury. In in the next chapter, verses 6 through verse 8, he says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. I think one of the, that eighth verse is a just a superlative verse. Notice all the alls in it. God is able to make all grace abound to you. Notice he has been calling this contribution as the grace of God. Well, God's able to make all grace abound to you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. (laughs) In other words, as we give our money into the collection on the first day of the week, that money is, of course, to be used for God. I, as an individual member of a congregation, have an obligation to give bountifully to that congregation, to put my money into that common treasury. I don't have the right to say, well, I don't like what the elders are doing with it, so I'm not going to give. Don't have that right. I'm giving to God, not to the elders. The elders are going to be responsible as to how that money is used. I'm going to be responsible whether I obeyed God and giving as I've been prospered. Giving bountifully, liberally, not grudgingly, of a cheerful heart. That's how I'm going to be judged 
the elders will be responsible and be held accountable as to how they use that money. And I will admit, in many congregations of the Lord's church today, that money is not being used properly. But that doesn't give people the right, I'm not going to give because of it. The elders will be judged for how they use that money, but I'm going to be judged whether I give or not. And I have been given that order by God to engage in that grace, that gift that He has given unto us to give our money into that common treasury. Now that doesn't mean that we can't give elsewhere if we want to based upon our own desires. But I have an obligation to put that money into that common treasury, that grace. And by doing so, by giving in that way, I am... Bearing fruit. If you go back into the first chapter of Philippians, when he mentions the fact that you brethren, you Philippian brethren, are in fellowship with me in the gospel, he's talking about as I go and I preach the gospel, then because you have given and the church is sending me money, sending me these funds, you are in fellowship with me as I preach and I teach someone. You are bearing fruit through that work. And so we need to be a giving people. But we find another passage that we really want to deal with. And we'll deal with this rather extensively, but in Colossians, the first chapter. And in verse 6, and then in verse 10, Paul would write, which is coming to you as, in, as it is in all the world, bringing forth fruit as he doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and, <clears throat> and knew the grace of God in truth. Then you skip down to verse 10, and he says, That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, in verse 6, we have that we are to bear fruit. We are bringing forth fruit. In verse 10, a fruit and being fruitful in every good work. Now then, of course, we omitted a few verses there. So let's go back and pick them up to see what the context of this bearing fruit that Paul is talking about and what it's dealing with because you always have to keep passages within their context. So in verses 7 through verse 12, we find, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk uh, worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which, he, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. As we read the context in which these two t phrases are used in relationship to bearing fruit, we learn several things dealing with what bearing fruit involves. First, it is when ye learn the truth. 
Now, there's a lot that could be said about truth and our learning the truth. Truth is an objective fact. It is not subjective. It's not it's a term that we hear regularly in our society today, my truth or your truth. Truth is truth. It doesn't matter what I think about it or what you think about it. Truth is truth. It is objective in nature. That truth will be true whether you're talking about a thousand years ago, whether you're talking about today, or if the world continues for a thousand years or a million years, that truth will still be truth. It does not matter if you're dealing with the United States of America or Russia or Africa or any other place, that truth is still truth. It is outside of the individual. It is objective. That's what the nature of truth is. Well, truth in relationship to this that he's dealing with, when you learn the truth, that is learning God's will for us. In other words, I study God's Word. I learn what He has to say, and that Word is truth. We could if we had the times, go back over into John 17 and verse 17, that sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. Or we could look at uh, 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 22 and 23, in which we're going to be obedient to the truth, and how that that truth is God's word. It is the incorruptible seed. It is the word of the Lord. It is the gospel going down into verse 25. We can learn God's Word. Well, now then, when you learn God's Word, so here's the context that he's setting forth the bearing of the fruit. You have to first learn the truth. But then you're having a love in the Spirit. This is very basically, when he uses that phrase, love in the Spirit, it is a love that is generated by the Spirit's inspired teaching. Jesus, uh, before he left this world to return unto heaven and sit down in heaven at the right hand of the majesty on high, gathers his apostles, tells them, I'm going away, But I'm going to send, he tells them, another comforter. And if you read and study John the 14th, 15th, and 16th chapter, in chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, and specifically in chapter 16, verses 12 and verse 13, we find that there's four things that the Spirit is going to do for the apostles. One of them is to bring to or give them all truth. He is going to be revealing truth unto the apostles. They then took that truth that the Spirit revealed to them, and by the Spirit's inspiration, they spoke it and they wrote it down for us. Now then, there is a love that is taught within that teaching, a love that is thus generated by the Spirit and His teachings as set forth by the apostles. Now then, that love as set forth by the Spirit, generated by Him, is a fruit of the Spirit, is a fruit that we are to bear. And thus we could call upon the the numerous passages of Scripture showing that we are to love God the numerous passages of Scripture that teach us to love one another. By this, Jesus said, ye shall know, or the world will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. There is a love that we must demonstrate. It is a love that has been taught to us by the Spirit. Remember in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, He says that when you obey that truth, you come into a natural affection. uses a Greek term, Philadelphia. Natural affection of the brethren. 
And then he gives the command, make sure that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And so we have to learn, we grow, we develop in that love as taught to us by the Spirit. But then there's Paul's prayer. And in that, he prays that they would first be filled with a knowledge of God's will. We should all have that knowledge of God's will. That goes back to learning the truth. We learn God's will. We come to knowledge of what God says. That takes study. It takes effort. It takes work on our part. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. There is a continual growing process coming to that knowledge of God's will, of God's Word, His desire for us. A second thing in that prayer is with wisdom. Wisdom is the proper application of our knowledge. We might know something, but if we cannot apply it, then that knowledge is not really worth all that much. We must learn to properly apply that knowledge. Now, a lot of the songs that we sing even, Paul mentioned this morning about thinking about what you sing. Well, we have a knowledge of what those words say, but do we have an application of it? Do we know how to properly apply that, those words that we sing? Along with, do we really mean them? A lot of times we sing things that we don't really mean. But now then, here's God's Word. And being able to take that Word and apply that Word to specific situations that you and I are going to face. We might not be told in God's Word a specific as to how to deal with a situation that you and I are going to face today. But God has given us within that Word everything that we need so that we can properly apply that Word to the situation. And we can come to a conclusion a where we will be pleasing unto God. That is walking in wisdom. That is the type of bearing fruit that we need to have. And then the third thing that he mentions in his prayer is with spiritual understanding. Understanding of those precious privileges and our principles that God has set forth. So there's Paul's prayer that we be filled with that knowledge of God's will, with wisdom, with spiritual understanding. But then he says also that we are to walk worthy of it. A walk, a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is that proper application to what God's word says and applying that to our life, so that others see us, and they see Christ in us. Paul would write in Philippians 1 and verse 21, For me to live is Christ. Then he could add, to die is gain. Well, that's walking worthy, because people would be able to see him and see his life, and by such, they see Christ in him. Do people see Christ in us as they see and observe our life? Walk worthy of that life to which you've been called. And he sets forth the aspect of another aspect of bearing fruit is the exhibiting of patience. Don't have time to develop this, but patience is seen in four different areas within God's Word. There's patience with God. Patience with self, patience with others, and patience with circumstances. We need patience in all of those areas. Then, a joyous life. 
We are to be joyous. We are to have the joy within us, within our life, that we can rejoice all the time. Doesn't Paul say rejoice without ceasing? Well, a joyous life. So many times, though, we portray to the world that Christianity is a miserable life because we can't do this and we can't do that and we can't do this. That's the very wrong thing to do. We bear fruit by being joyous within our life, recognizing all of the blessings that God has done for us, the salvation of sins that we have, all of these things. That's bearing fruit, being joyous, and then a thankful life. We are to be a thankful people. God, both Old Testament and New Testament, continues to emphasize that aspect. Be thankful. Be a thankful people. And yes, that means thanking others for those things that they do that is kind, generous on our behalf, but also live a thankful life in relationship to God, realizing the wonderful blessings that He has given us and that wonderful gift of His marvelous Son to die upon the cross for you and for me. A thankful life. And in doing these things, we will be bearing fruit for God. Lord willing, next week we'll go into the remote context as we look at chapters 3 and chapters 4 in this same regard of bearing fruit. But it, you cannot bear fruit unless you're attached to the vine. You're attached to the vine through your obedience to the gospel, upon your faith, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Jesus Christ, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. It's at that point your sins are washed away and you're raised to live this life of bearing fruit unto God. If you have not obeyed that gospel, we would encourage you to do that this morning. Or if you have, but you haven't continued to live the type of life which is exhibited by what we're talking about in bearing fruit unto God. Remember, Jesus talked about in John 15 that that one branch that does not bear fruit will be broken off and cast into the fire. So if you need to repent of your sins and come back to faithfulness and begin bearing fruit within your life, the fruit that God talks about, then why not come and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins as we stand and sing this invitation.